Uh, as is traditional at the forum, what we like to do at the very beginning is set the scene, give you some context, and also hear from a very familiar voice. So without further ado, please give a very warm welcome to the chair of the uh, Forum for the Future of Agriculture, also the chair of the RISE Foundation, Yanis Potochnik. Yanis, over to you. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, by the way, I was one of those wrestling and wrestling hard, and I managed with the transport system, of course. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning and welcome to the 15th annual conference of the Forum for the Future of Agriculture. The world has changed in 1972, when the Club of Rome released the famous The Limits to Growth. There were 3.8 billion people on the planet. Welcome. A few months ago, we surpassed 8 billion. We moved from an empty world dominated by nature to the full world dominated by humans. For the first time in human history, we faced the emergence of a single, tightly coupled human socio-ecological system of planetary scope. Just think about climate change pandemics internet, trade, travel, global security threats, and I could continue. We are more interconnected and interdependent than ever, and obviously our individual and collective responsibility has enormously increased. Our first ever meeting took place in Bibliotheque Solvay, a short walk from here. During the concerns over rising food prices leading to food insecurity, Although multifaceted, some of the key reasons for that particular crisis were temporary and arguably based on ignorance, leading to ill-considered stock building, panic buying, and a lack of transparency in the market, all of which proved relatively easy to solve once a degree of rationality returned. Today, we face challenges of an entirely different order of magnitude with devastating war on our continent due to Russia's invasion of Ukraine. After a year of conflict, we see many severe consequences. Unfortunately, there are no signs of good prospects yet. This acute crisis in our region has also exposed our deep fragility. Fragility we ignored for too long, of course, times were good. And we are also facing chronic crisis, the origins of which stretch much further back than 2008, and whose main drivers currently appear far more intraceable. I'm of course talking about the triple planetary crisis related to climate change, biodiversity loss and pollution, and fragmentation and inequality not only persist but even deepen. The consequences of this chronic crisis will be far-reaching and even more devastating for our way of life, including agriculture and food system, which provides the foundation for humanity on Earth. Today, I continue to think that, for the most part, the actions we are taking are not bold and impactful enough. Arguably, they are akin to taking painkillers, and this will not heal chronic diseases. Rather, they just hide them and even make them worse. Dear friends, why it is so critical to go further to manage our natural resources more, more effectively? According to International Resource Panel, which I co-chair, a science policy interface in the area of natural resources Resource use is at the roots of our triple environmental crisis. Resource extraction and processing drive 90% of land-related biodiversity loss and water stress, 50% of greenhouse gas emissions, and one-third of health-related pollution impacts. The trends are alarming. Material use, which comprises everything extracted from the earth, has tripled since 1970, in the last 50 years, 
and without transformative change, it will double again by 2060. Resource use harbors deep inequalities. High-income countries have benefited most and have driven the planetary crisis, while emerging and developing economies hold least responsibility and are facing the worst impacts. The World Inequality Lab recently published its 2023 climate inequality report showing how much inequality is driving climate impact. The top 10% of global emitters are responsible for 50% of global carbon emissions. This is not just a country level story. The highest consumers everywhere are responsible. The report shows that carbon emission inequalities within countries deserve as much attention as between the countries. The central question we should ask is, how do we meet human needs and maximize our well-being in the most energy and resource efficient way? For that, we would need to decouple our economic growth and well-being from the natural resource use and environmental impacts. And it is clear that in high-income countries, absolute decoupling is needed. When analyzing what would need to be done to make the visionary European Green Deal implementable in a global environment, Systemic Club of Rome and Open Sciences Foundation in International System Change Compass identified three major blind spots. First, the lack of holistic system change approach. Leaders as well as public administrations, but majority of us, if I'm honest, lack capacity or knowledge of how to translate system change visions into their concrete policies and investments, which sometimes ends in conflicting actions and policy logic that hinder the real transformation. Second, by failing to go to the roots of the problem, meaning addressing the fundamental drivers and pressures, we lack focus on natural resource use as well as market signals leading consumers and producers' behavior. Our current system does not incentivize sustainable resource use, in fact, quite the opposite. As consumers, we must behave responsibly, no doubt, and we must be well informed. But when addressing consumption, I do not want to point the finger only at the consumer, even if the choices we make are critically important and we have to take responsibility for them. But the point is also that many consumption-related questions are in the hands of policymakers and producers. Consumers are confused. We ask them to behave responsibly, but market signals are sending them in the opposite direction. We have to pay more for healthier and environmentally responsible products, food included. And it is on policymakers to fix that. We are also bombarded and manipulated by advertisements from producers. I have picked this message a few days ago at, at Brussels airport, working hard to bring you a new shopping experience. And third, a lack of demand side focus. Policy attention, also in climate efforts, it's mainly given to the supply side of the economy, to the cleaning of the existing economic system. It is lacking the attention to the demand consumption side. Our climate efforts are stalling, and if we are to restart and make them effective, to start closing the existing gap among high-income and low-income countries, we must stop ignoring the inherent wastefulness of our production and consumption systems, particularly, of course, in high-income countries. We must ask the question, who is surpassing planetary boundaries and living beyond their safe operating space by not integrating commitments in their NDCs that address material and consumption footprints? For example, it would be in vain to decarbonize the production of steel, as important as this is, if it is still, still used to produce underutilized cars and empty houses, which contribute just to traffic and property market bubbles, 
but not to the real social prosperity. Standards and behavior patterns of the current economic model were set by high-income countries. And only by looking in the mirror first, we would give nobody an excuse to repeat past mistakes and avoid collective failure. In the Global Resource Outlook 2024, to be released next February at UNIA, the International Resource Panel will follow the well-being logic and redefine sectors as systems. Instead of optimizing economic output measured by GDP, we will redefine sectors as systems that provide a societal function, human needs, like nutrition, mobility, shelter, essential consumer goods, and their supporting systems such as water and energy. This will allow cross-sector innovation and shifts to a more future-fit business models. Considering the fact that valuing nature, while critical, will likely take time before being fit for purpose, future fit business models based on service provisioning logic, a major opportunity to stimulate producers delivering human needs while reducing the use of energy resources. I could basically summarize this part of my speech by saying if we want to protect animals in nature, we have to extinct animal, uh, sorry, elephants in nature, we have to extinct elephants in our rooms. Now to the forum. In recent years, it has been underpinned by a significant expansion in our partnerships, particularly at the level of our strategic partners. We've also expanded the range of supporting partners across the agri-food system, which today include not only global corporations and cooperatives, think tanks and NGOs, who all share Forum's vision, mission to build a more resilient and sustainable food and agricultural system. Over the past year, we've taken further steps to promote global outlook of the Forum, starting by strengthening transatlantic partnership my colleague uh, Mark Titterington called a delegation to the US to learn more about what they are doing to promote agriculture as a climate and sustainability solution, driven by the goals and extraordinary level of investment in the Inflation Reduction Act, which has rightly challenged us here in Europe. We should not underestimate their sustainability efforts. We need more of this international collaboration, and this is why I'm also pleased that the Forum has joined together with the Australian Farm Institute, the Canadian Agricultural Food Policy Institute, and the Farm Foundation in the US to establish a global forum on farm policy and innovation. All these organizations are represented here today, and I'm extending my warmest welcome to them. As well as taking the opportunity to remind us that we need to include like-minded organizations from other parts of the world, especially Africa, as soon as possible. We'll also hear today from one of our new and first ever digital tech partner, Microsoft, who will lay out the possibilities and opportunities to transform the business and operating models of the agri-food system, some of which continue to struggle to escape from the old paradigms. When we first met in 2008, the idea was to demonstrate that agriculture and environment were not mutually exclusive, but rather inextricably linked. Looking back, it seems odd that we would even have to consider this. But we did, and we still do. The objective was to bring different constituencies together to build this critical understanding. It has been as inclusive as possible, ensuring a diversity of voices in the room, challenging each other in a constructive way. I do believe that to a large extent the Forum achieved that objective and contributed to the meaning, at least, of resilience and sustainability in the agri-food system. We must now bring all the relevant constituencies together, not merely to discuss, but truly to take action and to fix tomorrow today. This is actually, as you know, the theme of the 2023 annual conference. We must collectively strengthen our efforts 
if we are to reverse the environmental and climate trends we are facing. The Forum, along with our partners who are part of the agri-food system, are committed to play active role of building a more resilient and sustainable food and agricultural system, which mitigates the effects of climate change and restores biodiversity and our ecosystems. It is why today the Forum is taking the step for the first time of publishing a call to action, which sets out a number of commitments, including to support the development and scaling of regenerative agriculture in conjunction with similar approaches underpinned by common matrix, which drive enhanced outcomes for productive and environmentally sustainable farming, to support the valuing and accounting for the use of natural capital, such as water, soil, air, and biodiversity by agri-food system, to contribute to the development and alignment of public and market-based incentives for nature restoration and delivery of other ecosystem services, to share knowledge and support the, pursu the pursuit of innovation and technology and practices that enable environmental as well as food security and importantly, moving away from those which don't. To integrate sustainability into supply chains and the global agri-food system leaving no one behind. We will use these commitments to monitor and to report on our collective progress and to drive change by using our convening power in each of those areas to find the most impactful solutions, both in Europe and globally. Hopefully, many of you will join the call and contribute to the necessary change. And you have the opportunity today to share your first thoughts also with our conference illustrator, who is working to bring your ideas to life in visual form outside the hall. To be clear, last week, IPCC's report underlines the fact that our survival is not it's now about speed and scale, and both are currently not on our side. To conclude, trying to maintain the current economic system and at the same time fixing the chronic triple planetary crisis, it's simply not consistent. Just creates a lot of confusion and lobbying. It is also simply not possible to do both. We have prioritized the prevailing broken economic system for so long that it sometimes proved in impossible, impossible for decision makers to imagine a different one. Any suggestion to deviate from our resource extraction growth driven path is met with accusations of being anti well being and having disregard for people people's hard-earned livelihoods. In essence, my dear friends, it is just the opposite. Few basic shifts are needed. First, we must shift away from the prevailing economic logic, which puts humans in function of economic growth, simplistically defined by GDP, towards an economy that it's effectively meeting human needs. The current logic, it's both, logic, it's both ethically and ecologically unsustainable, and we simply need to set the order right. Second, we need to move from an economy considering humans as external and superior to nature to an economy acknowledging that we are embedded with nature. Destroying nature is destroying ourselves. Third, we need to move from an extraction-based production system to a circular creation-based production. We should stop stimulating extraction-based economic success and rather reward responsible, innovative, creative ways of meeting human needs. And finally, we must fix our governance structures and make them fit for purpose. This is the paradigm shift in leadership and governance that's needed. Realization that states 
long-term sovereignty can only be protected through genuine, deep cooperation right now with the institutional reforms to match a question not asked for the first time, but not yet adequately answered. In short, we must improve our collective resilience, and we would need a well-designed intergenerational pact. Without a real system change, we will not miss only the climate and biodiversity targets, but more, because, dear friends, access to and use of natural resources have been in the human history always closely related to the level of well-being achieved, but also to stability, security, conflicts, wars. Just remember the importance of access to land, water, oil and gas, minerals, or precious metals. The whole history of colonialization of nature so central to fairness and equity. The lessons learned recently from the terrible war pandemic and the hottest summer since we started to record the temperature are more than convincing to understand that changing our relationship with nature is ultimately not only environmental, but also economic equality, security, resilience imperative. The relationship is not stable, nor it's balanced, and it will be resolved either with collective wisdom and effort or in a hard and painful way, through conflicts, hunger, pandemics, migration. And I could continue. This is the choice we have. This is the real question behind our sustainability and food security efforts. And this is the real challenge behind ability to feed current and growing population. Thus, we must broaden and strengthen the front of stakeholders advocating for change and putting existing chronic challenges in a strategic context. I hope that this will be well recognized and considered also when designing the follow-up of the European Green Deal vision. It is not about either fixing the current acute crisis and challenges or effectively addressing the chronic ones. It's about solutions which are simultaneously providing answers to both. The future will be green or there will be no future for all of us. Thank you for helping us delivering this noble quest and thank you for attention. Uh, Yanis, thank you very much indeed uh, for that pretty uh, sobering analysis. Yanis is going to be with us uh, throughout the day here at the forum, and he's going to have a few words at the very end of the day. But if you want to collar him and have a discussion with him in the meantime, he will be around. So uh, do reach out to him if you need to.